Um, welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. This is Comprehensivist Wednesdays that we do along with the Greater Philadelphia Thinking Society. And uh, what we're going to do today is something actually very, very different than what we normally do. Um, what we want to do is we, I want to, we've been doing meetups on Marshall McLuhan. And I want to get an idea of how, how they're going. The sense I want to see what is it that people are getting from it? What is it that people are finding useful? Um, and then I'm going to, I want to use that feedback to try to decide what to do, how to deal, you know, how to handle Marshall McLuhan in the future. Um, I am deeply interested in Marshall McLuhan, so I am um, I'm going to be doing meetups on it. I have already one set up on his uh, PhD thesis on the trivium uh, with Peter Berkman. We're just trying to finalize the date. I have other, other things planned too, but I've done a few meetups. Um, what I'm, as you might have noticed, if you're a regular, what I'm doing is that I'm doing deep dive into some key thinkers. So Marshall McLuhan, currently we are doing Marshall McLuhan, Louis Sullivan and Julian Jates. Okay, so I want to get feedback from you. This is like a way of um, like a half time of seeing, you know, how, how are things going? What is it that you are getting? And I want to listen very carefully to what you're saying. Um, and just to make sure that I get what you're saying, I'm going to repeat back what I think you're saying, and then you tell me whether I get it 80%. I will not be able to get it 100%. Let me know if I get 80% of the gist of what you're saying. If not, you know, say, no, 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 you, you're completely off. This is what I mean, okay? So I'm gonna, uh, you know, I want you to let me know what you have gotten uh, from Marshall McLuhan so far. Not just from my meetups, but from him as a thinker. Um, so this is a beginning, uh, and this entire meetup is going to be a conversation. So the format is that first I'm going to call on people to just volunteer. You can take up to you know three minutes, four minutes, something like that. Try to be brief. Try to be concise. Say what what you've gotten from Marshall McLuhan so far. What what you have learned. What do you find interesting? What do you find puzzling? Then I'm going to try to summarize what I think you're saying. Tell me whether I've gotten it 80%, then we'll go to the next person. Once we have done, anybody who wants to talk, it's volunteer basis. I strongly recommend that you volunteer because that's the best way to actually learn uh, by speaking. So speak out what you know. And in the process, you discover that you know probably more than you know in some ways and less than you know in some ways. And you'll never find out if you don't speak. So, uh, so go ahead and do that. Uh, so let me, um, I will hear what you have to say. I'll try to repeat it back to you. Um, and then I will put it all together. We'll do breakout rooms and then we will do questions uh, at the end, like a lightning round of questions. We'll gather all the big questions people have about Marshall McLuhan and we will try to answer them. But even if we completely fail at answering them, having the big questions is going to be probably the biggest thing that will be the result of this meetup. So that's what I'm hoping for. All right, so folks, um, so go ahead and, so the first part is go ahead and tell me what you think of Marshall McLuhan, what you've gotten. You can take plenty of time. You can take up to three minutes, four minutes. Uh, go ahead and type exclamation mark. The rules remain the same, type exclamation mark in order to speak. Keep on topic. We're talking about Marshall McLuhan. Be brief um, and feel free to disagree uh, with anything on any, with anybody and do so courteously. All right, so uh, who would like to go first? Go ahead and just type in and then we will go ahead and I'm gonna keep track of everything and try to repeat back to see if I, if I can follow what people are saying. All right, who'd like to go first? I'll, I have a question. Is, is this the time for the questions or that's later? I'll, you, you can ask a question. That's fine. You, you know, if you if, go ahead, what, what would you like to say? Okay. What was it about him that stood out to make you want to study him? Like, what was that initial oh, thought? Excellent. 
Excellent. So that's that's a great, great question. So let me take the question right away. Um, so what happened was that I discovered him only about less than a month and a half ago, uh, thanks to Bill Frezza, whom I've been interacting a lot with, and then Mark Stallman. Uh, Mark Stallman knows uh, Marshall McLuhan really, really well. Um, and what I found is that he has a very interesting combination of talking about what is going on now in terms of the tools that we use. So he has a conception about the tools that we use. I mean, his idea is that um, you know we make our tools, we shape our tools, and the tools shape us. And that seems like a very simple idea, but it's a very profound idea. And that is really the core of it. And what I found when I started looking at it is that his depth, he has an incredible depth. He's extremely good at speaking to people. You know, he is a celebrity when he speaks and he's able to relate to anyone very easily. At the same time, he's coming from a great depth. So this combination of being very effective at speaking about things that are profound and coming from a very profound base, which doesn't, which he usually doesn't talk about. So that's why I find him extremely uh, intriguing. Thank you very much, Abram. So next up is going to be Joe and Dave. Joe. I like the idea of doing questions uh, mm -hmm. a little bit more, but anyway. Um, um, folks, you can, you can, the thing is that this is very flexible format, so you can throw in questions. If you want. So, okay. Okay. I mean, I, you know, I, I think that the one distinguishing characteristic that I've taken away is how it relates to a lot of the systems thinking, mm -hmm. uh, uh, pre uh, discussions that we've had specifically how to think of things in the whole. And when we're talking about figure and ground that we kind of grasp that um, you know the figure is the medium and the ground is the context and that we have to understand that the whole is greater the the the, the, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts and, and you know that was talked about by Akroff that was mm -hmm. talked about by Bucky Fuller that is and they were actually in contact with one another so I think that they're to me that was something that that really kind of stands out where you know for if, if i were to pick one particular thing um the other is and you kind of alluded to it with the tools we shape the tools and the tools shape us is the technology that tra uh, that transfers the message changes us and changes society and i think that he's provided a really an excellent framework for how to lay that out and the importance of what change, what real change is, what's meaningful within that. Um, the other is the idea of just something, and, and it kind of relates to Peterson's, uh, uh, one of his rules where he talked about a little bit how uh, uh, storytelling and the printed word and rituals kind of formalized and created religion. But the reason why I think that that's important is that you're talking about um, where, uh, you know, you have the printed word and then you have orals and then how you process that information orally. Mm -hmm. And, you know, through your, you know, you, you hear it. And then whether we're, once you hear it, you can then, you, you, in, in the terms of like st st storytelling, uh, you become a consumer of the information. And when you become a producer of the information, that transition is incredibly important, whether that's through written word or whatever it may be. And when those transitions actually happen and the mediums that actually support that, um, I find to be also very powerful in distinguishing what is meaningful change when something is actually a a, a high impact change you know uh, change to society. So uh, the idea from TV to digital, mm -hmm. or from um, radio transistor radio to digital, or to uh, to uh, TV, 
you know, these, these understanding the impacts on our minds and our behaviors, I think is profound and understanding that these are tools that are actually changing us and not what we're saying in these tools is, you know, it's something that really helps us evaluate uh, ourselves better. Um, that's just it off the top of my head is that, you know, the, you know, and the medium is the message and you know, mm -hmm. all, all those other things too. Got it. But so, um, so Joe, I'm going to try to summarize what you said. Tell me if I get 80% of the gist. Okay. That's all I'm going to try to do. I think you're saying, you got it. <laughs> 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 you're saying two things. One is that he's focused on the whole. He's looking right. at things that is, as a system. He's looking at his, he's looking at the ground where most people focus on the figure. So he has a very clear, crisp distinction. So that's all about thinking holistically about how is this whole system working? And second point you're making is that he's looking at tools and to see how these tools fit in the whole and what the different characteristics of these tools are and what is it, what kind of kind of psychological effects these tools have. Uh, in particular, you talked about passive versus active, you know, consumer versus um, you know, producer, and you illustrated it by different kinds of tools. So kind of what do the tools do to the whole? So they, I think the whole point is like the, the base, kind of almost like a philosophical point. And then on the top of that sits this point about technology or how the whole operation of a human being changes based on tools. Is that a fair, it, have I gotten at least 80%? That's, yeah, that's excellent. I mean, and, and yeah, I mean, and, and the ability to then uh, understand what change really is within that framework, because it, you can't just change the message. Like that's just one part of it, but the whole is the medium as well. And that, yeah, you cap, anyway, you captured it perfectly. Thank you. Thank you. Perfectly. So thank you. Next, next up is Dave, followed by Maritza and Maxine. Dave. Thanks, Shrikant. I'll start by coming to confession. I have not read uh, Marshall McLuhan. I have obviously heard of him, but I did read the art, the Wikipedia article, and I noted, noted he compared transportation and communication, which to me is very interesting. And I heard David McCullough speak about his book about uh, John Adams in the, the era, of the, era of the foundation of our country. And you know, if you're in Charleston, Louise, or Charleston, South Carolina, for example, and you want to send information to your friend up in Boston, well, you get on a ship and you send a letter at the same time. Well, the letter and you and the ship get there at the same time, or, or if you're in Chicago and you see some in the Chicago paper, and you jump on the Transcontinental Railroad out to Los Angeles, well, you and the newspaper get there at the same time. So in that era, and really, I think about up until 1900, transportation and communication were exactly the same thing because it was all at a snail's pace. And that's why radio was such a breakthrough that it was instantaneous and the coverage uh, you know, with different stations was universal and it was free. Now you had to put up with advertising. But the fact a poor Kansas farmer could he buy this radio, but then he could hear the Metropolitan Opera from New York City in his farmhouse. And during the Depression, he would hear President Franklin Roosevelt tell him everything was going to be okay. And I think we so much underestimate what that did to bring our country together, to educate our country, to entertain our country. And I think a lot of Marshall McLuhan's work was investigating the effects of that. And I think he talked about advertising and how to reach people, how to convince people. Uh, and I look forward to much more information about him. Thank you very much for hosting us tonight, Trikon. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you, Dave. And we've done several meetups, so I would recommend uh, starting with Peter Berkman's meetup on core ideas of Marshall McLuhan, and then going to Andrew McLuhan's meetup on um, evolution of Marshall McLuhan's ideas. Now, 
uh, I'll try to summarize the point about transportation and communication. Um, the before elect, electric age, the transportation and communication is the same. Um, with electric age, what um, what Marshall McLuhan calls the electric age, electricity is almost instantaneous. It yeah, travels. Yeah. Uh, so what it does is that it actually changes geography, the conception of geography, because you can actually communicate. You can have the effect on people spread out geographically instantly, initially with telegraph, then with radio, then with TV. Um, now with Zoom, for example, you know, we are all spread out everywhere. And it doesn't really matter that we are spread out. We are able to achieve the same thing. So it kind of overcomes geography. Um, and um, so that's, it's, that's, it's a very good point. And, um, you know, Marshall builds on that uh, incredibly. Um, so I'm not going to go into details because um, th th that's the point. I'm just going to summarize the point about the communication and um, uh, transportation. Another way of looking at it is the issue of geography. It's like the geography is different. You know, the global village. Had, right? Yeah, he had the idea of the global village, um, which is like the consequence, which is the consequence of this. Uh, thank you. So next up is going to be Maxine, followed by Maritza. Maxine. Well, I read all of his quotes, and the one that I understood was there is absolutely no inevitability as long as there is a willingness to contemplate what is happening. Uh, right? So you can sit back and I know people that do this and they say, woe is me, uh, this is inevitable, what is going to happen? And they don't even try to see what is happening and how they can fix it. They just sit there and vegetate and wait for the end of the world to come. So that is very meaningful, that particular quote. Um, also, um, I don't agree with a lot of these quotes. I mean, they say diaper backwards spells repaid. Now I know what that means, uh, but I don't believe that way. Um, and and um, publication is a self invasion of privacy. Well, what would we do without publication? Even if it's fake news, we should have some contact with the outside world. We can't just keep looking inward. We have to look outward. So a lot of these are not art is anything you can get away with. What is he kidding? I don't believe that. I mean. <laughs> I know about the art world and maybe some of the most modern art now is uh, according to what he said, but really, are you going to, if you look at the uh, medieval art and everything with gold and little characters and everything, well, how could he say that? That's ridiculous. So. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Maritza. So um, first point, um, so I want to summarize it by two things. Um, and I'm trying to also add some context from McLuhan in order to make sense of uh, stuff. Uh, so for example, uh, you know, you, you correctly kind of zeroed in on the fact that, you know, the contemplation of media actually gives you control over it because most people, the problem when, when we say that tools shape us is that we are not actually aware of the tools. We just use them mindlessly. We watch TV mindlessly. And then it happens, things happen to you. But if you are mindful of that, if you contemplate that, what is what happens to me when I watch TV? What happens to me when I actually have a conversation with another human being? What happens to me when I read a book? And you compare what happens when I speak? What happens when I write? And when you reflect on that, that is what gives you the ability of making choices of the use of these tools to rise above them instead of being shaped 
by them. So you choose the con you know, kind of constellation of tools that you are going to use to create the effect that you want. Um, so I think that's, that's an excellent, excellent point. Go ahead, Maxine. Thank you for the explanation because it, it helps to clear things up a bit. Thank you. Um, next about quotes. Now I have to say that Marshall McLuhan is a very impish guy. Okay, he deliberately will say things to get rise out of people. So most of his quotes are probes, what he calls probes. Okay, he is not a person who will give you his argument in steps. He will throw something at you and see, oh, let's see what the reaction is. So a lot of his quotes are like that. Many of his quotes are humorous. Many of his quotes are designed to create interest. I'll say, okay, what are you saying? What are you saying? And then he will tell you something and then go from it. So they are all kind of conversational uh, pieces uh, for a successful television personality, if you will. So these are like his one-liners um, that he uses. So that's what I would say about the quotes. Um, so it is, so there are some times where he is really um, doing very deep things like medium is the message or, you know, you shape tools and the tools shape you. That actually is capturing of it, but a lot of his quotes, many of them are extremely colorful, extremely uh, interesting, but they are, you can't really grasp them until you grasp the entire context from which he's trying to do. Because one of the things is that he's a very, he's trying to communicate with the masses. That's what he's focused on. Um, I was talking to Andrew, uh, his grandson, and one of the questions was, he used to work on the theory of communication. And he says that every person has a theory of communication. So I asked him, what is Marshall's theory of communication? So he went on and then I said, okay, okay. So this is what I get. He's saying, so he's, the theory of communication according to Marshall McLuhan is, who is your audience? And what effect are you trying to have on the audience? So audience of Marshall McLuhan is everybody. He's trying to talk to everybody. And what effect he's trying to wake them up. He's thinking that most people are sleeping, okay? And he's just trying to wake them up, okay? Because that is a prerequisite, as you're saying, as you correctly pointed out, Maxine, that contemplating. And for that, you have to be awake. <laughs> so all he's doing is that, so there are a lot of his quotes are designed to wake up people. So I hope that helps. Uh, next up is Maritza followed by Jade. Maritza. Um, that, that point about where, um, you know, Marsha McLuhan is telling us that, you know, folks need to wake up is kind of what strikes me as most enticing in um, all the different things on him that I've read thus far. Um, I, I really like reading that the, the interest in what I'm hearing from him and he's, is that he's telling us that all of these objects, we need to view them as tools that are extensions of us. And I, I find it fascinating that specifically speaking of um, electric technology, he's, he makes the comment that we've, it, it provides an extension of our senses and our nerves. And that just, it gives me pause because I, I don't think that in today's world, we have enough people contemplating that type of connectedness with our, um, with these objects that, so we wield them as tools and that's, they are tools, but they're not just tools. They're tools that are extensions like, you know, it, you're going to treat differently if I grab a, like a, one of those plastic hands that is used by somebody who has no hand, I have two hands. So I might grab it and just treat it carelessly because to me, it's just a plastic object. And yet for the person to whom that is giving back the faculty 
of something that they had lost and allowing them to do basic things like grab, they're going to treat that with this utmost reverence that I just in my carelessness, not because I'm a terrible person or not because I want to be dismissive, it just won't have occurred to me that I'm wielding this really powerful tool with absolute disgrace. And that's what I hear him saying to us that we're doing about so many of the things in our lives today. And it's, it's, it reads like a cautionary tale of these things are great and we have to give them their due and we have to contemplate them. And, and what I hear him saying big picture is our technology is far outpacing our contemplation of our technology. And if we continue to march in that fashion as a society, we will be lost. And, and the reason I hear him saying that is because this, he actually says that he believes it's an, you know, all this media, these new technologies are, they're an electronic extension of our consciousness. And that is like so deep to me. I mean, you know, I, I don't think of a pencil as my, con you know, extension of my consciousness. I don't think of any of these things, but when you read some of the, the things that um, he's saying, I, I can see how that could be true. And the lack of our contemplation of it leads to scenarios and can continue to lead scenarios where we run full steam ahead with a technology without ever asking ourselves, just because we can, should we? And um, that's all I have so far. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you, Marisa. So I'm going to try to summarize it. I'll try. Um, I think the biggest point that you made is Marshall McLuhan's point is that technology is extensions of ourselves. And the technology today, the electric technology, is the extension of our it's extension of our neural circuit. You know, it's it's our nerves going across the world and everything and connecting to everything. And it is, I agree, and it is a really awesome, uh, you know, prospect. The other thing I would say, it, and you, you said that, um, you know, technology is outpacing us and our ability to contemplate technology. Um, the way in which Eric McLuhan put it is very simple. He says, people keep saying that Marshall McLuhan was ahead of his time. And it is actually true. You watch his 60s videos. He said, are you talking about the internet? Where was there an internet in the 60s? That's exactly what you're talking about. But he says, no, no, no. He was not a person ahead of his time. He says, most people, as Mayer was pointing out, is most people live in the rear view mirror. They live, they think they're living in the world that they grew up in. Because it's not a question of what you explicitly think. It is how are you acting? That's, that's what matters. And most people are focused on that. So he says, all that Marshall ever did was to actually be open to the present. So that is also very profound and it connects to the point about waking up. Future is already here. Like as Mark Stallman puts it, future is already here. You know, uh, It's a question of, are you going to look? Are you not going to look? And that's what Marshall McLuhan is about. And it is very profound because, and, I think this idea of extension of us is a huge deal. So it's not something which is impersonal, that these things become part of you. And the way you are operating using that technology transforms how you act. So it's, it's a, it becomes an integral part of you. So I think, I think that is what um, I got from, does that, is that capture at least 80%? Yes, yes, it does. Okay, thank you. Next up is going to be Jade followed by Madeline. Folks, um, if you know anything about, if you've learned anything about Marshall McLuhan, I would like to hear what you have learned so I can calibrate what, what we are going to do next about Marshall McLuhan. Jade, go ahead. Um, I don't know. I'm trying to be impressed by um, him, but I'm not very impressed. I believe he's an intellect um, worth considering, but I feel like 
for the most part, his the things that he brings up kind of comes to boils down to common sense. I think he's observant and I think he's willing to look at things that other people aren't, but he's not necessarily looking at anything that is revolutionary. He's pointing out the obvious is a lot of what he's doing. Like it's stuff that's evident for everyone to actually notice if they bother to notice. Um, and then I think even with the, I forget the catchphrase, but the, the media thing, um, I feel like a lot of that just boils down to relationship dynamics and any relationship that you have can, you know, be contextualized in the same way. It's just like, if you have a new friend usually, or like you're, another friend ends up dropping off or something else, like anything you do shifts. Cause like dynamics are essentially like, um, a way of saying what happens, how things change, how things affect each other and impact each other. That's that's what dynamics are. And like anything that you, uh, how did I put it? Um, anything we, we, we interact with creates a relational dynamic. So whether it's a child, like the way that I would interact with a child would be very different from the way I interact with an adult. The way that I interact with a precocious child would be very different from the way I even interact with a um, superficial adult. Like the two conversations would be night and day even. Um, and um, so it's even like you, you would think that perhaps I would have a deeper conversation with an adult when with a child, but not necessarily. You know, it's it, it's very, very much so dependent on, again, the medium. And the child is the medium that I'm interacting with. And I am the medium that the child is interacting with. That's why when you see children um, who hang out with a lot of older people, they end up being, quote unquote, more mature. Um, they're not more experienced, which people often um, kind of confuse maturity with experience. They're not experienced, but they're more mature because they, they're, they're exposed to concepts. They're exposed to different things. <coughs> So I, I I think it's 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 interesting, um, it's interesting how 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 we do. I think it's interesting how we qualify relationships and separate them. And again, I, I'm I'm back to the compartmentalizing thing because I feel like this is a concept that is is it can be um, applied again across disciplines, across most anything. Again, anything that has an interaction is going to have some sort of similar thing, whether it is electronics, whether it's writing, whether it's um, <coughs> TV, internet. And then I think also, I don't know, I can't, I can't say definitively, and I'm just gonna suggest that no one can say definitively, but I suspect that the masses, the quote unquote masses, because we are technically part of the masses, even if we're outliers in the masses, um, I don't think we we consume all of this stuff because we don't know better per se. I, partially, yes, but like even the media these people are consuming and in these people, I will consider myself part of that too. Even though again, I might not be consuming the same way <clears throat> because like the media will tell people, they'll be like, Facebook posts telling people how people will post things on Facebook telling people how detrimental consuming Facebook can be. Um, the the news will tell you how detrimental watching too much news can be. Like that will be a, 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 a snippet for the afternoon. So it's like even the media sources are telling us that these media sources can be harmful when consumed badly. But it's like humans, this just just what humans do. Like we look at junk food and people talk about the junk food ep epidemic quote unquote. And, you know, it's a choice. You know, again, there, there are other drivers, biological things, taste, sensation, we, we crave them. But again, that's what I mean, it's part of the human process. Like we, we, we kind of decide. So part of this is elective. And I think making the assumption that it's, it's all just, we're, we're just all like zombies and Borg. I think there is, is an element of being Borg, but I think there is an element of this being an elective choice. I like junk food, so I eat junk food. Yes, there are consequences, but I enjoy the junk food enough to do it. I know there are consequences to consuming this much Instagram, but I like Instagram, so I'm going to do it anyway. Okay, uh, so Jade, I'm going to try to summarize it. Let me, it's going to be difficult. It's very difficult to summarize you always, but I'm going to try. Um, so first point <coughs> you're making is that you find most of what uh, Marshall McLuhan is saying as obvious and commonsensical. 
And in particular, you're pointing to the uh, relationship dynamics that you're saying that everything works like that. That when you add something, you subtract something and all, you know, you, you miss something, it comes back, you know, all, all of that. Um, and so those are the second point. And the third point that you made is that when you see a pattern of what masses are doing, um, some of them are kind of aware of it. Some of them are not aware of it. And there is the entire variation in between of what is going on. You cannot assume that everybody is doing it uh, blindly. You can't assume that. So there is a variation of the, um, the intentionality or kind of awakeness or contemplation that varies. It's, it's like a variable uh, that is going on. And uh, so those are the three things that I hear you saying. Is that 80% kind of summary? Is that okay? I guess so. Again, the medium is the message. So it's kind of what you take from it. Okay. Um, but I, I would say the one thing that I would um, tweak a little bit is it's not a question of everything being obvious because things hide in front of our face all the time. I think that's also being, it would be interesting to learn what Marshall, Mc, Mc, I don't remember how to say his last name. Mc, McLuhan. Or, um, it would be interesting to find out the things that were not obvious to him because we're not even wondering like, where were his blind spots in the world? What, what did he overlook? What did he not notice? What did his family always say? Like, dude, why didn't you see that? You got it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Jake. <laughs> uh, next up is going to be Madeline, Kevin, and Lisa. Madeline. Yes. Hi, everyone. Um, I have found the Tetrad to be very interesting. Um, just to very briefly say for those who are new, uh, both Eric and Marshall McLuhan's criteria in formulating the Tetrad was that a statement had to apply to a fork as well as to a TV. The Tetrad is basically all media amplify some function that's enhance. They obsolesce another that's obsolesce. When a medium is pushed to its limits, it flips. They call that reverse. And the fourth one is retrieve. It retrieves something that had been previously obsolesced. They're not necessarily sequential. They can be simultaneous. So I was thinking, um, I disagree that these laws apply to everything that humans make like a fork. They may apply to a TV. And I think it would be incredibly interesting um, if we use some of the 52 living ideas groups to explore that with examples. Like, I can see three ways to do it. One would be chronological, one would be a single medium, and one would be a sort of fanciful one. So chronological one, we could say divide up into four groups. Um, one group could work with the very earliest stringed instrument known, which is uh, basically a turtle shell with like a leather thong from a bowstring stretched over it. So that's the very earliest. A violin could be another group. Um, a theremin, which uh, for those who don't know what a theremin is, it's a, a, an, an electronic instrument with a string uh, that's a sliding scale. It's not fretted. And then the fourth one could be MP3. And so that would be chronological. Um, or we could divide into a couple of groups and try two entirely different types of things. Like one group could work with the telephone and see how the Tetrad applies to the telephone. I think the Tetrad would work very well with the telephone. Now, what about a glass jar with a screw top metal lid? Would the Tetrad work with that? So we could have a, a separate group working on that. Then there is something that is my new favorite um, as of yesterday when I discovered it, <laughs> um, which is an idea I had actually thought about, which was um, taking little flash drives or USBs or something and attaching them to the legs of carrier pigeons to avoid the internet. Well, lo and behold, I am not the first genius to have thought of that. There is an article in Wikipedia called IP over avian characters, carriers. It started as a joke, 
on a, as an April Fool's Day thing. Um, but basically it has actually been tried. It has been more successful than the internet in rural areas. It's a completely ridiculous and counterintuitive idea. And I think that the Tetrad might apply to that better than it would apply to like a fork. So also I was thinking I might, um, I might, uh, It, 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 it sounded as if Andrew McLuhan, Marshall's grandson who spoke, um, has experience in leading Tetrad groups and doing whiteboards of them. And maybe he would be willing to do this. I don't know, unless unless you wanna do it, Shrikant. So that's it, thank you. Okay, oh. Th thank you, thank you. So let, let me try to summarize, uh, Madeline. So you you find Tetrad interesting. Uh, and I, I, I certainly do. And um, so I've been trying to figure out how to play around with it. And I really, I mean, I, you're talking about, you know, kind of dividing into groups and looking at uh, tetrads. And that's something that I'm definitely going to do uh, soon. I'm thinking of kind of doing like a tetrad game or something like that, um, far more intensely than you are thinking of. Um, but um, firstly, um, McLuhan in his, there are two books. One is uh, Laws of Media. And then second one, I think is called Lost Tetrads. He has done tetrads for lots and lots of things. I don't know whether he has done glass jars, but he has done very similar things. Maybe, uh, I don't know exactly which ones, but he has done like hundreds of them uh, on this one. So we can use that as a starting point. Uh, we can do all kinds of things. So I, I really like the idea of doing uh, the, uh, the the tetrad um, you know, because that's the only way you can actually master these things. Um, so that's, uh, so I, you know, so I, I think that Rad has a, you know, is a very powerful idea like you. And I think that the idea of doing kind of actual, um, actual kind of workshops or almost like games with Tetrads because it, you kind of have to approach it like game first to kind of see relationships because they're going to be at the edge of your ability for, for many things. And it would be interesting to have like lots of people talk about the same thing and try to say, okay, what do you think is happening with the tetrad of telephone? And each person would say a whole bunch of things, you know, what does it enhance? You know, what does it obsolete? Uh, what does it, um, what does it flip into when you use too much of it? What, how, what happens to you? And then, what is it that it brings back? Uh, so, uh, I mean, clearly, I mean, another kind of quick way of looking at it is that, you know, telephones really bring back orality, like speech, which print had not had kind of de-emphasized. So it brought back being able to speak. What it enhances is the distance with at which you can speak. So it takes the, you know, I always think of it as starting with the retrieval, it retrieves orality. What does it, how does it enhance orality? It enhances by destroying the geography. So you can be talking across, um, across a great deal of field. Um, uh, the next one is what is it that it displaces? It displaces, um, you know, it displaces books to some the kind of reading a little bit. It displaces actual communication between the geographical area. It kind of disrupts it because suddenly you have a way of communicating outside. So there is a, some disruption of uh, kind of geography uh, that happens. Uh, it doesn't become obsolete. I don't, that's why I don't like the term obsolete. I think I, I use the term displace for that. And what happens if it becomes too much? What happens if you're you know, on the phone all the time? You kind of, your rest of your senses get affected. Uh, you know, you don't go out as much if you're just yakking on the phone all the time. So, so there, there, there are kind of consequences of that being kind of the main, you know, when it becomes too much, it has negative impact. So we can look at, you know, many, many, many things uh, like that. And I look forward to doing that. So Madeline, a great idea. I really appreciate that. Uh, next up is going to be Kevin and Lisa. Uh, folks, if you would like to share what you've learned from uh, Marshall McLuhan, even if it is brief, or lengthy, you please go ahead and do that. 
even if you want to just say, I don't know what he's talking about, or I really like, that's fine too. So let's, uh, so Kevin, you're next. Thank you, Sank. Uh, I agree, you know, most of it. Kevin, can you it. speak into the phone? Is it better? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, my clue and uh, look at the media and see a figure ground is really the same shape. It's a figure ground, like a yin and a yang, all the chaos, mm -hmm. all that loop about the feedback, also fade forward, right? And uh, another way we think about this is current exist situation. Maybe I'm a little bit biased here, but my way or highway. That's current situation mostly we design. That's from a ideology, ideology and from approach. My product is the best. If I would ask a one lady on the two speakers debate something, can you speak one thing your opponent is correct? You agree with? Start from there. Um, and also, it's like we do um, even education. We go to multiple choice. Nobody we get a profit answers. Only one is correct. If you look at the other three possible get a percentage, obviously they are correct. Correct also. It could be a situation based. And it, like, let's see a human revolution. It's the enhancement, not as replacement. Like we, one is I remember. Um, uh, a neuroscientist, uh, 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 I can't remember. One question from audience asked him, it's replaced that, no. It's an enhancement. It's not like we minus, we destroy everything. It's something, give people some choice, leave it. Maybe later on, we'll pick up the three we have a chance. Look at species, look at our uh, languages on earth, look at other things. This just disappeared. Um, also, uh, a, even more further, more for culture of MBTI. You see the positive relationship, subject, object, uh, thinking, or feeling, a judge is perceiving. You see all paired, during. It's not here. My question would be, why we reality like that way? It's, it's we didn't think it could be our belief. Maybe I believe it could be our uh, type of uh, racism. Maybe it's uh, polycism or derelism or monotheism or nothing believe. Yeah, that's my, I'm gonna wrap up here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. It's gonna be difficult to summarize you, but I'm going to summarize you in an impressionistic way. Okay, um, what you're saying is the power of multiple perspectives. Instead of having a single perspective that a person with ideology has, we are saying, this is it, everything else is wrong. Instead of that, you know, McLuhan's approach this, whether this tetrad or you're talking about order and chaos or yin yang, or you're looking at multiple functions of uh, Carl Jung, psychological functions, you're bringing different, you're looking at the same thing through multiple angles. And that's a very powerful and very different technique than what is prevalent today. Um, and that's why, for example, tetrads of McLuhan have not really been used even by McLuhan scholars. They tend to shy away from the tetrads because the epistemology behind that is very different than the epistemology of modern science. Another way of putting it is uh, in terms of Aristotle's causes. You know, Aristotle had four causes. Causes is not the right word. Um, it's very difficult to understand people in the past. I think the best word is shape. So when you're trying to understand something, you're trying to understand what is it shaped by. And the Modern science focuses on what is called the efficient cause. You know, it's like a billiard ball model. What hit it so that it moved that way? Whereas Aristotle or McLuhan, they think of it as kind of multiple causes that interact with each other or kind of multiple shaping factors 
like the structure of it, the form of it, uh, like the function of it, what is it trying to do? Like the material of it, how, how does the material that you're using, like the electricity as a material, shape what it becomes? Um, and, um, so, and, and the efficient cause then, so those are the four ways in which you're trying to look, analyze it. And that's again, a way of using um, Aristotle's causes again, kind of a thing that, um, that Kevin was talking about. So that's, Kevin, this is a very impressionistic thing of kind of the difference between multi-perspective way of looking at something versus a single uh, my way or highway, as you put it. Is, does that fairly summarize what you're doing? I know it is very impressionistic. Yes, yes I okay. agree. Thank by you. By the way, I'm going to read one and last one. So, give me a labor and a place. And to stand, I will move the earth. Seems that we have tools. Where's place? A place of environment. environment. Environmental approach is important. It's need people, you know, awake about it. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, all right, folks. So we're going to now go to uh, two more people and then we'll do breakout rooms. Um, let me know if you're extremely familiar with McLuhan. If you have read a lot, just say, I you know, just say you're very, very familiar uh, in, in the breakout rooms. Uh, no, in, the, in the chat, just let me know that. So then, then I can arrange the breakout rooms accordingly. Um, next up is going to be Lisa. Lisa, go ahead. Hi, uh, I don't have much background on McLuhan. So I only have two brief questions. The first is what troubles has the media caused? Mm -hmm. And the next question is, what's the prescription? And that's it. <laughs> okay, wonderful. Um, it. So for the questions, <laughs> let's do let's do questions immediately after the breakout. Okay, all right. So could you could you please bring up these same questions back up? Okay. Thank you. All right. All right. Uh, thank you, Lisa. Next up is Patricia. Patricia, go ahead. Yeah, I am. Um, one thing first, I put it in the chat, but there's actually already exists a game called The Medium which is based on doing the tetrads. Oh, really? And it was actually, um, it's funded, it was started by the um, estate of Marshall McLuhan and oh. the McLuhan Foundation. So it's available online. Um, oh, really? Okay. Yeah, okay. so so we don't Can, have to reinvent the wheel. Uh, Patri Patricia, could you do, do all of us a favor and uh, find a link and put it in the chat? Sure. So that we, otherwise, people will be going to all kinds of mediums. Mediums is a general, general. Yeah, book. no, sure. Yeah, I will. Uh, go ahead, go um, ahead Patricia. The other thing that I just wanted to say is, is to, more to the point of, you know, yeah, what is the point? You know, because, I mean, obviously, Marshall McLuhan was saying these things in the 60s. This was groundbreaking. Why are we now talking about it? And why are we still in a position where we are being led? by the medium the you know it, the the environment that we're living in with this you know in instant information and you don't know the source of the information and how do we control the information and is it right to control the information i think there's just so many questions and right now um with children learning online we're as educators, we're doing a lot with digi digital literacy. And just what are the responsibilities of being online? What do you need to look for when you're doing an online search? Who's the information coming from? You know, you need to be an informed consumer. And I think that we as adults haven't figured that out yet. You know, Jade was talking about, you know, we have the choice to control this stuff. I don't think that we are aware enough yet. You know, there's too many people who are still being, you know, they'll read an article from 1997 and say, oh, this is happening and not recognize that it's not a valid research design, that it's not even timely anymore. Um, so I think we need to realize that this is happening and we need to be more responsible with it. And like, how do we do that? Uh, wonderful. I, th I think you, you summarized yourself really, really well, uh, Patricia. I don't think I can do a better job. What, what you're saying um, is, 
that, uh, you know, this is happening all around, all around us and how can we be responsible? So please ask that as a question uh, again, and I would like to see what, what people have to say uh, about it. So what we're going to do is that let's go ahead and discuss just for 20 minutes uh, in the breakout rooms uh, about, about Marshall McLuhan, and then we'll come back and most importantly, come up with questions. Okay, and then we're going to do a lightning round of questions that works, uh, lightning round of answers, which works really, really well. Uh, you will find out. We've been doing that for a couple of our meetups, uh, and I'm going to try that for for this, uh, the medium online. Thanks, Patricia. All right, I'm starting the breakout rooms now. We'll be back here in 20 minutes. Let everybody uh, speak for about a couple of minutes about what they got from what they have learned about Marshall McLuhan and then have a general discussion. Keep on topic, be brief, be courteous, let others speak. And if you uh, need to just go ahead and type uh, exclamation, uh, no, not exclamation mark, but go ahead and click on ask for help and I'll help you. Starting the breakout rooms now for 20 minutes. Hi folks. Hello. Hi. Hey. Hello. I was wondering if you're going to be in a breakout room. Yes. Yes. I'm going to cool. do. Uh, I'm going to do the breakout rooms. Madeline, I'm planning to record this breakout room. If you do, don't want to want your thing, you can just turn it off. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, so, folks, I want to continue on tetrads. Uh, yeah. Madeline has read up a little bit of on tetrads. Meyer, are you are a little bit familiar with tetrads, right? Oh, totally. Yeah. Yeah. I've, that's my favorite. If I had spoken, that's what I, I would have said what uh, Madeline was uh, mentioned there and her suggestion on tetrads and sure. going. Yeah, go okay. ahead. So let's let's go ahead and talk about tetrads, folks. Um, so here is my uh, I'm going to let's see if I can find my screen. Give me a second. OK, I have to. Uh, so firstly, uh, let me ask first feedback from Maritza and uh, Joe on the tetrad. Uh, presentation. How was the Tetrad presentation? I thought it was excellent. I mean, I thought it really kind of, it, the, I like how you line things up and it brought uh, context to the Tetrad. It kind of gave us a progression of what types of technologies and then we could kind of go through and see what the changes were. So the one in particular would be uh, that we went through is, uh, um, you know, we went through TV to digital, we went through transistor to digital, but we also went through oral culture to literature. And I think that that, that made it very clear as to what McLuhan was talking about um, and how it engaged our senses. Uh, okay. So I, I liked it a lot. I mean, uh, Maritza, was it, what did you think? I really liked, um, the, the biggest thing for me was um, changing um, obsolesce to, to um, displace right. really just helped like it was like a little tumbler in my brain that it just so many of the things they were saying about the tetrad were easier to digest just by making that one word change. I had lot less trouble with it because of that. Oh, that's wonderful. Now I've made one more one word change. I want to show you. Give me a second. Let me see. Oh, oh no, it's the wrong screen. Give me a second. That's a big change. <laughs> uh, let's let's try it again. Uh, I don't know so what mean, I'm Joe, so mean. <laughs> uh, okay, here is the right one. Let me see. Okay, this is the right screen. Let me see if I can get to it. Okay. These must be Apple computers. They sound so complicated. It, okay, can you see it? <laughs> oh, nice. Okay. Overextend. All right, let me let me show you. Okay, so here, here is what I um, enhance is I think perfect. Okay, I, I've I've struggled with all the words. Of all the words, my favorite one is retreat. Okay, that's that's a very powerful word. Okay, um, the enhance I always try to. Um, I always try to compare that with extend. Enhance and extend always compete for attention in my mind. Because the, as Marisa, you were saying, the seeing all of these things as extension of human beings, 
is a very powerful way of, you know, uh, of, of thinking about these technologies, right? So, so that, that was one. Um, the other two, I, yeah, go ahead. I have a good question though. If you have extend, doesn't that get rid of displaced? Uh, no, because uh, extend or enhance is simply, you know, you're trying to increase something. Okay. And okay. then it is going to displace something as a result of that. Like if you are watching too much TV, you're not going to watch too many, or read too many books. Okay. Like okay. That. Okay. And I do think that displace is very good. I like it. I, I mean, I like displaced. I just, just trying to put those two together. Absolutely. I think overextend is supposed to be what used to be limit, right? Limit, right. I mean, see, the full description of that, right, of what, what the effect is, is that no matter what tool it is, if you use too much, because if you think of all tools as extensions of yourself, imagine your hand, right? If you extend your hand, well, if it extends too much, it's going to imbalance your entire body, right? So anything that you extend, if you extend it too much, it's going to jeopardize the integrity of the body. So there is some limit to it. And what happens is that if you go beyond the limit, it's going to have negative impact. Okay, negative impact, I think is a more general way of putting it rather than reverse, because I find that the negative impact can be in multiple dimensions. Overextend, I think captures that very well because it captures that, that there is a limit and you're overdoing, you know, you're overdoing it. It connects with like financial overextension, extension in terms of, oh, you have stepped too far from what you were, you know, and lost your balance as a result of that. So I think overextend uh, captures, captures that, okay? Um, the last, the other thing I want to tell you, I don't have much time, so I want to tell you this one, okay? I find that there is a sequence in which you can think of this, which is quite powerful. Solemnous game. It is, uh, so it's, uh, so for me, I call it redo. So R-E-D-O. So you're trying to redo everything. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you're, you start with retrieve. Okay. Because you're not really trying to, you can't really arbitrarily take something and try to extend it. Why would you do that? What is it going to do for you? If you start with retrieve, what you're doing is that you're saying, what is it that am I missing? And you're saying that human being is a certain integrity to it. And we go through all these stages, all of history is open to you. Is there something that you need to retrieve? So that is like the inspiration for the tool that you're going to build. So you're taking the retrieve who comes first in my mind. And then I'm trying to use the current technology. So I look at entire of history to say, what do I need to retrieve? What, have I, what, are, what are we missing today? And then I'm trying to say, okay, what, how can I use the technology to enhance it, right? So th then that naturally displaces something. As soon as you enhance something, that's going to displace something. And then you run into overextend and overextend will start actually creating, you will start missing things now. So that is going to again, do the second cycle of retrieval. So I find that this sequence, I find it very useful. Now, McLuhan also, though he kind of finally put it as all, you know, you can move in all directions. Initially they had started with a sequence for a long, many years they worked with sequences and then they moved to kind of all parallel. Um, I find this very useful as a way of kind of thinking um, about tools because I'm, I, it's, it, because it makes it more purposeful of saying, what do I need to retrieve? What is it that culture is missing today? What do we need to retrieve? Um, that really kind of sets the purpose. And then you're kind of focused on the technology uh, when you're saying, okay, what do I need to enhance in order to make that happen? So any thoughts? I need to think about this some more. So um, I, I really, I'll oh, go ahead. Uh, go ahead, Mayor, you're not said much, go ahead. Oh, yes. Uh, so I, I really like that. Uh, well, I, I like I, I was just thinking about overextend there and and how you replaced um, uh, reversal. Um, the I, I'm reading here. The, there was a 
okay so back in 2012 when i first got into the tetra there the um there was a a buddhist uh teacher who who applied the facebook uh the tetra to uh tetra tetra uh to to facebook and um and you know the the uh, so that you had the retrieval the reversal the, the overextend you have um and uh, I was just thinking the the I mean, he writes here that reversal is the principle that any development creates its own negation, and and in the last sentence, uh, it, it has the the part where it said when a when a when a media when a medium is extended further, then so I, I'm just thinking that overextend would that um, you'd have to add another it adds another layer of complexity in a sense. Uh, whereas in reversal didn't, but but yeah, I think I think overextend is really great, and I like that. Yeah, you thought about this for quite a while. Yeah, thanks, um, Maritza. Um, the, this um, imagery bothers me a little bit. Actually, it mm -hmm. seems to imply that one side is happening separately from the other. I don't think it gives the the, the right imagery that it's all happening at the same sure. time. Sure, that, that's a great point. I mean, see, the way, way I see it, see working with this one is that all of this is like together in the sense that it's- I see. Uh, imagine like, take, take the left-hand side, right? Uh, this is, you can see my mouse? Yes. So it's like, it's like going like this. Okay, so you're kind of like a demented bee and you just keep hopping around. Yeah, but that makes sense. Okay. Yeah, it's like it's going like this. So it's it's basically just a spiral movement through the whole thing. Now there are other movements possible, like for example, uh, McLuhan's. They started with enhance first, then displace, then kind of overextend, and then retrieve something like that. So they they looked at it. You know, this is to this as this is to this. Right. So what you're trying to do is that you're trying to use these patterns to actually hit everything. And I think the way in which your mind works is different, each person. So for some people, some is going to work. For example, you know, this is like smooth curves on this side and you know, sharp curves on this side. Some people will find this better. This is actually my way of thinking about television and digital. So the left-hand side, which is actually the right brain stuff and the Right hand side is that kind of left left hemisphere stuff, and you can kind of it's more convenient to think of it separately like that. Um, so so that's that's another thing that this diagram is trying to do, of saying kind of multiple ways of you know formulating it. Um, I would um, I'd like to add something. Mm -hmm, go ahead. Okay. Um, my thing wasn't lighting up. I didn't know if you could hear me. Okay, so basically, um, I was I was adding this into the figure and ground idea. I was thinking that. Um, so I made notes on what you just said. So starting with retrieve, what is it that I am missing? Can uh, can can I give you the the version of McLuhan on figure and ground related to this, or would you like to work your stuff out first, whatever you prefer? Oh, my stuff out first, definitely. Go ahead. <laughs> um, so I would say that the thing that, that I feel is missing that I want to retrieve, whatever that is, that's the figure. And then once someone has worked through the whole process using the existing technology, enhances, displaces, overextended, it's out of balance, then something else can be retrieved this whole process that was just done has become the ground. And the new thing to be retrieved has become, is, is the new figure, but it doesn't have to be something from within this realm. It can be something else entirely. So say you've used the telephone through this process and retrieved orality. The next thing you might feel is missing is, um, I don't know, scent. So John Waters comes up with that film where you have that scratch and sniff stuff in the theater. Um, so it, it could be something else entirely and this becomes the ground from which you now perceive something is missing. Wonderful. Um, so let me give you McLuhan's version of it. 
Um, McLuhan, and by the way, um, I, I really recommend The Laws of Media. That's really his best book. As far as I've, I, that's the only book I've read through, through and through, but I've, I've most of his books and I've been going through all of them. But that's kind of the deepest one, philosophical one. That's where he talks about tetrads. Um, so figure and ground is a core idea of his. In some ways, it is more powerful than the tetrad idea. And tetrad is a way of actually implementing figure and ground. So the two parts on this side, so this is the left hemisphere side, are the figure. And these two are the ground. So you say, okay, this is what I need to retrieve. That's there in front of you. That's what you need to retrieve. You start to enhance it. You actually are working on it. That's, that's the figure. That's your, but while working on it, you are actually ending up displacing something. That's not what you're aware of. That just happens at, in the background. And you do not even know when you have used too much of it. So you overextend. That also becomes the ground. So these two things, this is kind of right hemisphere stuff. That, that's where you are kind of at the edge of your consciousness. That is kind of part of the, um, part of, you know, this is conscious, this is unconscious, this is order, this is chaos, uh, whichever way you want to, you know, these are kind of different ways of looking at the same thing. But, um, but this is the ground and this is the, um, this is the figure. Right. You know, that, that, I, is, that is fascinating because um, it, it ties right in what you were saying about retrieve and enhance as the figure or the conscious yes, uh, yes. or order. It does tie right in with uh, the OODA loop and the creation and destruction. How so? Um, well, I, I guess the, um, the overextending and displacing mm -hmm. would be the... Um, the destruction part mm -hmm. and the retrieve and enhance or the conscious order part would be the creation part. Very nice, very nice. Uh, Mayor, you had something? Oh, I was just listening. Yeah, I, I, this is, yeah, I, I like that. This is pretty a, a fresh take on it with the, these, you know, these, these semantic, all these terms, uh, different terms that I'm getting here and thinking a lot more about this. Um, I've I've been haunted for years with with obviously with social media with with you know, and and applying the tetra to these to these platforms, um, kind of obviously knowing the effects and 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 not and and not really running into folks that know much about uh, Marshall McLuhan and the the four tetra there, uh, or or even read papers on like the effects of gamification or social media. Um, I I really like yeah I. I it's Wonderful. pretty. Uh, so, uh, Mayor, I like, uh, uh, can you send me? I'm going to put my email in the chat. Can you go ahead and send me a message? And I, I want to oh. know what what you know about, um, you know what what you know about Marshall McLuhan. Oh, no. oh definitely, yeah. He's so, a so really is, funny guy. He's a really funny person. Yeah. yeah. Uh, here, so it's fifty two living ideas at gmail dot com. Thank you. Just uh, drop me an email. We can go ahead and uh, correspond. Okay, folks, so let's see what time it is. It's about, yeah, we are about 20 minutes. Um, so I'm gonna start closing the breakout room. So any, any final thoughts, guys? Um, I, I, there's something that I, I might play around with drawing this as a sphere mm -hmm. and kind of there's internal and external mm -hmm. is the way I was thinking about it with ground and figure. And I just have to think it through. Um, but I think as a sphere, it might actually work even better. I don't know. I, I'll, I'll send it to you. Wonderful. Wonderful. I mean, if you hate it, you hate it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, this is, this is all, I mean, if you look at the sensibility that Marshall McLuhan has, it is the right brain sensibility, the right hemisphere sensibility. It's a right. visual sensibility. It is a way of kind of looking at multiple ways. Um, so that's exactly the way to go about it. It's really close to your four factor model too. I mean, it, it, the way it works together, it really yeah, works yeah, it, nicely. Yeah, I mean, this is, uh, that's the same, you know, that's same why idea. I, you have noticed that I've used the same colors. Oh, I don't know why this keeps happening. Give me a second. Oh yeah. 
That's right. They are the same colors. Yeah. Oh yeah. No, there's colors on time. They're young, young colors, right? They are. Yeah. They're just yeah. that's that's the same thing. So let me just see if I can manage to get it back. I don't know what happens here. Yeah, Maybe. that was so great when we did that when we were overlaying the two things when we were overlaying yeah. the Myers Briggs and the um. Yeah. And the the Ulu. 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 So, yes. So like retrieval is SI. It is the introverted memory. You know, you're taking oh. everything that you know in, right? Then you are extending it. That's the explicit thinking that you're doing. What it displaces is your previous habits. All that you, you know, many of the things that you valued before. And over extension, you actually are kind of, you know, you get an intuition about, okay, kind of overextension. It's kind of at the edge of your consciousness of saying, okay, these are the possibilities that this could happen. So this is like, you know, it, it maps very well into, into, into that. All right, folks, so I'm gonna start closing the breakout rooms. We got two minutes. All right. Cool. Oh. Needs a little I, bit. I, I, like, I like McLuhan quite a bit, I, I really do. I, I think it would be interesting to apply those things to um, well, I thought just innovation in general. Yep. So, uh, would... jo jo oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead, Mayor. Oh, I was going to say, Joseph, are you, are you like, um, have you, you I, I, I'm pretty sure you guys have heard of uh, Terrence McKenna. You followed any of his works? Yes. Yeah, he's, he's, uh, he's done a lot of quite a few, uh, about, about, I think, a, I think three lectures on Marshall McLuhan and I think they're called riding the wave or riding, riding with McLuhan or in, in uh, I, he mentioned a lot of the psychedelic stuff that he was into, uh, that he normally lecture on, but he included Marshall McLuhan in there. And, um, yeah, I mentioned a lot of James Joyce. Um, a lot uh, of folks forget that James Joy, uh, Marshall McLuhan was, Marshall McLuhan was a James Joyce scholar and, and he studied, uh, Ulysses quite a bit, a fair bit, right? Yep, and fin and Finnegan's Wake and and a lot of other works, but done by James. Folks, I'm going to go to the main room just in case there is. Welcome back, folks. Welcome back. All right. Uh, I think the breakout rooms are still running. Is everybody back? Give me a second. Yeah. Hold on. Okay. All right. Okay. So welcome back. So now um, for questions. Anybody has any questions that they would like to ask? Um, we'll keep all the questions. We'll list all the questions and then we're going to do um, lightning round. So everybody will get to answer all the questions. Now, some people had questions before that I asked them to hold off. Lisa, you had a question. Yes, it was, uh, what troubles has the media caused according to McLuhan and, or to anyone, anyone here? Um, and what is the prescription for those troubles, according to McLuhan? Wonderful. Excellent. So that's the first question. So folks, yeah. go ahead and let's go ahead and get all the questions down first, and then we will uh, have everybody answer the question. Okay, who'd like to go next? All right, go ahead and type an exclamation mark if you'd like to ask a question. Let me see. Oh, I'm sorry. I was not looking at the right questions here. Patricia, go ahead. Yeah, um, I'm along the lines with Lisa and we were in the same breakout room and 
this is great information. What do we do with it? How do we um, use it um, to make people more efficient or effective communicators using this medium? Since we're communicating to so many people, how do we get people to do it in a more value-based way? Wonderful. Thank you. Anybody else? Any other questions? Kevin, what's your question? Uh, what are the costs, like the situation currently? We keep ignoring this. Uh, uh, can you repeat the question? Uh, yeah, what's the, the reason, like we, we see that, you know, keep uh, obsolete or we like move forward? We, why we need to retrieval? Why, why we need retrieval? Yes. Okay, very good. Why we need retrieval. Very good, excellent. Okay, anybody else? Okay, so we can start answering these questions. And then if you guys have any questions, go ahead and put a question mark. So I know that there is a question. All right, um, let's see. So the first question is, what trouble is caused by media? And what are the possible solutions to it? Anybody wants to answer it? All right, if you wanna answer it, go ahead and type an exclamation mark. You know, what are the problems caused by media and what are the solutions to it? Joe, followed by Kevin, Joe. And uh, folks, I, keep the question uh, answers short if you can. Well, this will be really short because I'm just taking a shot. So um, what is wrong with media is not, I didn't think that that was the point. I thought the point was what was the, the mess, like the message that what was going through media really didn't matter. It was the idea of the medium that was actually what was important. So that part I understand. <laughs> But if we're talking about media, I do think it has created a certain degree of tribalism um, in general. And when we're talking about media, what type of media are we, could we, could I get clarification on that? Is it social media? Is it news media? Is it, I, I don't know. Like, so could we, I, I just need, what's that just say media? Media, yeah. I mean, uh, uh, well, without knowing that, I mean, again, I just think it's more about the medium than it is the, mm -hmm. the, the me what's being said over the over the message. <laughs> so, I mean, so that that's just, that's the best answer I can give. If yeah, without if it's not Wonderful. digital, if, yeah. Wonderful, thank you, uh, thank you, Joe. So, folks, um, what we'll do is that we you can take a between one to two minutes for the answer. That's fine. Um, next up is Kevin, Mayor Mike, and Maritza. Kevin. Yeah, uh, media could be could hijack our mind. I I would as the audience, I would look at the truth, find the facts, save my time, find the truth. However, most I get is a bias one. Thank you. Next up is Meyer, Mike, and Marisa. Meyer. Um. So um, I'll, I'll do a the, the tetrad for Facebook just to give everyone an example mm -hmm. um, of of like the enhancement, uh, displacement, obsolescence, uh, retrieval and reversal. So with Facebook um, or social media in general, well, primarily Twitter, Facebook and Instagram, um, you have an enhancement of so many things like communicating with uh, uh, your freshman class, uh, a friend from your, uh, a friend from a decade ago, you would have lost track of. Um, uh, and there's numerous enhancements. Um, then you have what what got displaced. Um, uh, I, I, so many things. Your a privacy has been taken away. Um, a retrieval. Uh, we we lived in big cities. Um, we lived in big cities. Uh, a lot of people. Um, many your a lot of folks. Uh, when you walk down the street, people didn't know who you were. Um, Facebook brought the village back. That all your everyone knew everything. Everyone knows everything about you. So that's a, 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 a characteristics of a, a characteristic of retrieval there. Um, reversal, uh, yeah, like a, uh, well, not, not a reversal, but like, I like how you said, overextend. Um, 
yeah, you can see that it uh, overextended with so many of the, um, you can take with smartphones and this digital, uh, social media, digital age, we're in um, a lot of things got re uh, reversed there. Um, but yeah, there's only, I was just doing a freestyle uh, tetrad there, but uh, yeah. Yeah, I, just giving everyone an example of, of applying these these four, and you could I guess you can share overextend and displaced. But you've already explained displaced, but yeah, overextend. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Mayor. Uh, really appreciate that. I think it's it's very helpful. Um, next up is going to be Mike Marizan Jade. Mike. Well, I have a kind of jaded. A, a view of the media, and um, uh, and not not uh, not too different with what our our our, our Miss Jade said about the media. Jade has Jade doesn't have a jaded view of media. Jade has no, a but I do. Okay, um, have, uh, there are other names that do have a jaded view of the media, and some of them had uh, a role in making them jaded. Have you heard of Cass Sunstein? Okay, no, let's not go too far. Let's not go too far, Mike. Okay, well, I, I, you, I got three minutes, so you said. But I'll, on, on I'll, topic, Mike, you can talk. No, to I don't have topic. three minutes then. Um, it, the, the discussion about fake news is, uh, uh, it is really there. Uh, and, uh, uh, and news is not just uh, uh, news, it's Facebook, it's Google. If I Google Marshall McLuhan and Maritza Googles Marshall McLuhan and you Google Marshall McLuhan, we're all three of us are gonna get different answers. Uh, and uh, and there's kind of, that, uh, there is a, an attempt at some global level to make that, to, to engineer consent, to engineer opinion. And uh, so that's, uh, that's the beginning of it. Um, Edward Bernays is, is uh, the guy who worked, uh, invented Madison Avenue. Uh, Cass Sunstein is a guy who wrote a book called Nudge. Um, Cass Sunstein is a psychology professor and a neuroscience person uh, at the University of Chicago. He spent about a year working for Obama as the, as the economic czar. And uh, then he, in disgust, he went back to uh, to ac ac academia. Uh, uh, Mike, at Mike. any rate, you, you, you're not going to give me three minutes? OK. No, no you, Mike, there's still rule is still keep on topic. You can't go off topic. You can't go. Well, well I'm asking, it's, I'm it's telling you that, topic. I'm telling you that the uh, purpose of the, uh, the news on the internet and mo very few people uh, subscribe to uh, in print magazines. Do you get Time magazine? No, I don't get magazines. No, okay, if you got Time magazine and the Time magazine that you got and the Time magazine I get would be different. The Time magazine and the uh, uh, in the because they know what they tell you what you want to hear. And thank it's you, a, Mike. It's a big industry now, and uh, this is far beyond what. Uh, uh, my, what Marshall McLuhan dreamed of. And the, uh, somebody famous once said, don't believe everything you think. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Um, all right. Uh, so let, let me give you my, my answer to the question. Uh, see, I don't think that uh, media cause trouble. Okay. I think that media makes some things possible. If they enhance something, the problem happens, the trouble happens when you overextend it. And in principle, the solution to it is what Maxine was talking about, is contemplating it, of seeing actually what it is doing, and then retrieving whatever it is that you need to retrieve in the face of that. So that, that would be my, my brief answer. Next up is going to be Marisa, followed by Jade. Marisa. I think if we consider that um, media is, like if we just look at it a little bit with the concepts that McLuhan has put on the, on the table here for us. He's saying media is a tool and it's a tool for us to use and do as we will. Now, um, looking at that analogy, if I consider you know, a power tool, 
a power tool in and of itself is helpful, right? But it is, I mean, it's in the word power tool. It can be dangerous. And so I think that that's the perspective that if you look at media where you can extrapolate where you would think that there is a, that the media is the problem. But again, even, you know, this giant, you know, big uh, table saw, I have zero business trying to wield a 15 inch uh, hand saw. I don't have the strength. I don't have the body weight. I should not be wielding one, but it sits on the table inert and harmless. If I pick it up knowing damn well, I don't have the strength to control it when I turn it on because the torque is too much for me. Do I blame the power tool when I damage either my property or my person? I don't think that that's the right perspective. And I think that's that if I were to have to point to a problem with media, it's that we, that's the way we're treating it. We're picking up that power tool that we cannot wield. And then when it chops our leg off, we're like, why, what did I do to you? You picked it up and you shouldn't have. Uh, uh, wonderful, wonderful, Maritza. That's great. Uh, next up is Jade followed by Madeline. Jade. Um, so I was, I was somewhat indisposed. So I kind of halfway heard Mike, but I, I think he was saying that I had a jaded view of the media. No, 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 it, it, okay. it was just a joke. You no, but I, I'm saying that I am saying that I kind of agree with him. I have a jaded view of a lot of things. I just, I, I just have a real sense of humor. So I, I, I deliver it like, you know, the stuff, the stuff is kind of ridiculous. And, and it's like, um, you know, but the thing is, I, I, it's not necessarily jaded because I'm like, well, I have other options, so it really doesn't matter. Um, so I obs I'm, I'm making those things obsolete in a kind of way. But I think my point um, is that was expanded by Mike because, you know, printed magazines, they do, they do have a purpose. And I think one problem with media is the way that things, we have less control, even parental units have less control because my grandparents had magazines on the table and magazines that would edify me and, and, and develop my mind in ways that they saw fit. They had a lot more control over what I was exposed to. Even if I was going to other things, they can put these things on the table in front of me. Kids, young people, they touch everything. And when you touch everything, you're gonna pick up the magazine if you're sitting with your parents and they're talking about something. That's just gonna happen. Um, and you start flipping through, something catches your attention. But um, the point I really want to make is that I think the real problem with media lies within us and our view of media's role in our lives um, and our view of how much it controls our life. Um, a very brief anecdote is like I had a staff of teachers who basically <clears throat> would complain that the kids' phones are always in their hands. They're like, the kids' phones are always in their hands. Like they don't want to learn, blah, blah, blah. The phones are the most important. And I had a hard time accepting that because when I heard that, I didn't hear the problem being the phone. I heard the problem being them. I'm sitting there wondering, why aren't you more interesting? Why isn't your lesson more captivating? Why is it that the content on that phone, which is nonsense, the kids were looking at nonsense. They were just looking at foolishness. And you are coming in and you're not more interesting. And you know what happened? When the teacher's content became more interesting, the phones disappeared. The teachers didn't even have to ask them to put them away. So my question is, we're blaming the media, but how interesting are we? Are you more interesting than that person across from you at the dinner table who's on their phone? Like, why aren't you more interesting? I think that should be the questions that we're asking also. Like, why is the media more interesting than me? Like, why? Wonderful. And it can be. Wonderful, excellent, excellent point, uh, Jade. Next up is Madeline. <laughs> Thank you, Jade. That was great. Um, I wanted to uh, introduce something that I brought up at the very end of the breakout room. Uh, it's not on the topic of tetrads. It's on the topic of um, McLuhan's theory about TV. It feels very wrong to me that he calls it a tactile medium. Um, I remember sitting in front of a TV set when I was a little kid, it bulged outwards. It was a smooth, cold glass screen. 
There was nothing tactile about it. And that was one of the things that was interesting about it. And um, I'm wondering, okay, um, for those of you who, like me, uh, two months ago, had never heard the word Thomism, um, it is the application of the thought of St. Thomas Aquinas, which was an attempt to reconcile uh, Christian thinking with the ancient Greeks, basically. Um, I'm wondering if this is part of some Thomas uh, way of thinking that he is kind of shoehorning TV as a, as a medium with tactility because it fits a theory, even though it doesn't really fit reality. Uh, uh, Madeline, can I uh, respond to that? Please. Uh, because it, it has nothing to do with the surface of the TV. W what it is, what, it, what the TV brings back, what they're saying is that what TV brings back is this mimetic performance, the movement. What is it that TV, how is TV different from, um, so you look at all the electric age, right? Electric age brings back various things from the time before and destroys the geography of it and makes it kind of everywhere. First, it was writing with telegraph. Then it was voice, the spoken word with the radio. And then there is a performance with the TV. And that's what he's, I think that's what he's trying to refer to is that it brings back performance, actual movement. And it's kind of like that is being communicated through that. Uh, and it's kind of like more motor neurons. So it's like, you feel that you're actually watching a performance. So you're kind of passively reacting to a performance when you're watching that. That's what he's trying to refer to. Uh, okay, thank you. I had thought of tactile as a uh something you touch rather than a, a haptic or mimetic thing. Thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, Madeline. Uh, next up, uh, Mike, do you have a question? I'm always scared to call on you. I, I was just going to uh, quote Marshall McLuhan about TV. Very good. Uh, he he coined the term a, a, a vast wasteland. Uh, okay, very good. Uh, you want to hear some more? Uh, uh, just a little bit, though. Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, pretty disgusting. A uh, hundred reality shows that do plumb the depths of depravity. Uh, child abuse, a never-ending stream of rich, spoiled, foul-mouthed housewives of various cities and whole families who are famous for absolutely nothing. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mike. Uh, next up is Dave. Dave, go ahead. Again, with no direct knowledge, but I'm just curious if Marshall McLuhan means that the television touches us. If you remember back in the 1960s, when we saw people walking over the Edmund Pettus Bridge and getting clubbed by policemen and policemen directing fire hoses at African-Americans in the South, that touched people. And people realized this is not right and then we pass civil rights legislation. So I wonder if that what is what he means, that it's much more powerful medium. Than it is much more radio. powerful medium. That's, that's what he's saying. He's saying that because it combines, it's a multi-sensory medium that brings together uh, many, many different fields together. Um, so on television, so his tetrad on television, let me see if I can find it here. Uh, give me just a second here. Where is this gone? Uh, give me just a second. I have the whole uh, tetrad of television versus. Okay, so what is it that the television enhances. Television enhances uh, simultaneous, it, it is simultaneous, resonant, multi-locational. So it, it's kind of, it's a oral medium and a performance medium. So it brings back what Merlin Donald calls the mimetic and the uh, mythic or oral culture. So that's what it enhances. Um, what is it that it retrieves? It 
retrieves the this is very difficult for uh, to follow this is it it retrieves kind of resonant interval between figure and ground. It retrieves passivity, mimesis, it retrieves the archaic um, in terms of what happens, what is it, what does it displace? It displays movies and radios and point of view, fixed point of view. Um, what happens when you overextend it, when you flip it, when you have too much of it, it causes inner trip or exchange of inner and outer. That's his, he's very poetic. So you have to read a lot in order to figure out what, what all of this means. But what, what it means is that it's kind of, it privileges fantasy over reality because people are feeding you whatever it is that they are feeding you and you're just consuming it and you're just reacting to it. So it encourages passivity. Um, so that's, that's what he, but it's a very deep topic. The topic that I really want to focus on is the best way to understand it is to see the distinction between television and print on one hand and television and digital uh, on the other. All right. So let's go to the next question. We've been talking about media and how it works. How do we use this information? How do we use this information to make things better? Any thoughts? Go ahead and type exclamation mark if you have thoughts. How do we use this knowledge of media to make things better? Jade. I don't know if I'm making things any better, but I know that I tend to try to use the media to um, to, to, to topple the amount of manipulation. So I have a lot of accounts. So I have an account that I would use just for things related to books because the algorithm knows that I want anything related to books. I have one that is dedicated to health and wellness. The algorithm knows that that's what I want. So I will, I, I it's, it's completely dedicated because I understood that I have one account where I can use like, and it's, it's Google. So they're all Google accounts. But Google kind of knows that there's one account where I will search anything, like if I don't feel like switching over. But if I'm trying to do a focused um, focused learning or something, and I know there's still the chance that something might be suggested to me that makes me go and find something else, but it's usually something that's related to the quest I'm already on. So for instance, if I already have something and it's dedicated to all philosophy, then guess what? The algorithm is going to continue to tell me about philosophy. And I, I, I like... I don't like anything really, but I will be not interested. That not interested button, because it'll try to feed me something else. And even if I do want to see it, I will not let myself see it on that account. I will share it. I'll yeah. email it to myself or something. So I think, um, I forgot what the answer is, but that that's that's how I think we fix, fix it. It's like, again, we use it the way we want. I can have the dominant frame. The, 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 media, the medium doesn't have to have the dominant frame. I have the dominant frame. Excellent, excellent point, uh, Jade. Excellent. Um, so it's all about you know you know being kind of conscious of it and kind of deliberately saying what is this going to do. Understand the medium deeply enough to be able to use it to your purposes rather than be pushed uh, by it. Next up is Meyer, Joe, Kevin, Madeline, Dave. Meyer. Oh, nice. Uh, thank you. Uh... Uh, I'll start off by saying, uh, yeah, Marshall McLuhan in an interview uh, with the CBC, I think, uh, I don't know if it was the 70s or 60s, he was asked if he had tried LSD. And um, he, he replied that, no, I have not tried LSD, but I have read Finnegan's Wake aloud. And takers of LSD have told me that is just like LSD. And yeah, that was some of his humor there. Uh, and I, I only mentioned that because well, you 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 quoted him and he 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 meant he used the word trip in there. Mm -hmm. um, he he's obviously around a lot of the counterculture folks at that time. Um, and uh, yeah, so to answer the question, uh, Jade just said, I, I think uh, I think majority of folks like just like eating healthy. Um, uh, you put a person in a in a supermarket. Um, uh, they have a lot of folks don't have a chance against 
a lot of the the way a supermarket is set up, uh, especially highly in, in highly industrialized countries where psychologists and uh, uh, mar uh, marketers are you know are, are using lots of great tricks and just like a casino. Um, I, I think I think a, I think a lot of onus is put on the individual. Um, we're overpowered by these platforms, especially today's social media platforms. Um, uh, one in particular, uh, one thing uh, that I'm particularly haunted by and scared of for my own self is uh, there was a Buddhist teacher who, who applied the Tetra to Facebook and uh, to Instagram and to 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 to, uh, to everything uh, to everything out there, um, and then he mentioned he mentioned that our sense of awe is being taken away with uh, watching and viewing and um, in uh, taking uh, digesting all of these great things that you know these majestic mountains or waterfalls or um, you know tricks of uh, uh, adventure trips and hiking trails and things that uh, normally we we'd have a we'd have a, a great sense of awe and he feel I, I remember him uh, I think he put it for it for the for the displacement or the obsolescence uh, that that our sense of awe is is being taken away here. And that's what I'm haunted by, or not haunted by, but weary of and very cautious of um, in particular. But yeah, uh, thank you. Everyone can have their own thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, Meyer. Uh, appreciate it. And I'm glad that you found this group. And I'm glad to find somebody who is deeply interested in uh, McLuhan. And we look forward to continuing the conversation. So let me rephrase the question again. Um, so, given what we know about the media, how do we use it to our advantage? for how do you use it for good? Joe, Kevin, Madeline, and Dave, uh, and uh, then Maxine. Joe, go ahead. Um, okay, so how do we use it for good? Um, I Both think- Both personal level or uh, you know, social level, what, what, whichever way you want to in interpret it. Um, I mean, I, I think that the way it gets used for good is that it provides visual context to, or provides images and, and allows us to visually consume uh, information that, that we would otherwise have to just imagine. So if I listen to something on the radio versus, and we're talking about, again, I guess, are we talking about TV as the medium? Uh, no, but this is a gen this is a general, general task, okay. saying that you know we've been studying the nature of media. Okay. What good, okay. What good is it? What good is it? How do you use this information? Okay. In All order right. to have a better life. I think that it provides us with uh, you know a better, more information, more knowledge, and therefore allows us to make better decisions. How to you know how to um, I don't know. You know, I need to think through this answer a little bit more. I, I really do. So forgive me. <laughs> no, no problem. Uh, let's go with Maxine first. So Maxine and then Kevin, Madeline and Dave. Maxine, go ahead. There are a couple points I want to bring up. You know, I, when McEwen was around, I was around and he was he definitely was part of the drug culture. He was on LSD. He was friendly with Timothy Leary. He was, I mean, he was every, and I'm not saying that was bad because they had vision and they looked into things and uh, they made things happen. Maybe what they looked into didn't come to fruition for 30 years, but at least they had insight into the future. Whereas today, uh, there aren't many people, well, we have the insight into going to the moon, but I mean, think about the, there are, are there any great philosophers today? I mean, what, maybe they should go back on LSD. I don't know, <laughs> but anyway, um, as far as the um, the media, I think that because we have all this um, 
it's killing our imagination. You used to listen to the radio and you would, Im you would imagine what the people looked like and you would imagine what was happening. And then you saw them and it was so, uh, it, you were so disappointed when you saw them. In fact, they took a lot of people off the air because they didn't, people were not responding to their dogs. I mean, think about even McEwen would have loved Zoom. He would have loved Zoom. It's such a shame that he was not around to be part of this because I'm sure Zoom is opening up a new world to people. It's we're opening up internationally to everybody. I mean, you get people from different countries here. You couldn't do that if they had to just come to New York. Um, it, it's, it's really quite, quite different. And I don't know why we would want to change it. We want to go forward with it and see, well, what can we do next? People are not looking for next. They're looking for now. We need next. And that's what the people uh, during the drug age were looking forward. Um, they were not looking at now because a lot of them were kind of messed up. I mean, and um, they, they didn't want now. Now was too structured. Now we, they wanted a little more freedom in their thinking. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you, Maxine. Next up is Kevin, Madeline, and Dave. Kevin. Oh, I would say I believe the media and 20% causes the believing and the learning uh, from them. And I use it when I need it, uh, how to value my time. It's just no time to, you know, I, I have the, all the social media account, but uh, once in a while, maybe one month, I accidentally going. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, next up is Madeline. Madeline, what do you think? How can we use this knowledge to make life better? Um, I was, I've was. i been thinking a lot about something um, in, the, in McLuhan's terms, I would call something that we need to retrieve, uh, which I've been aware of for a long time, which is our sense of embeddedness in the natural world as one species among others. And when I look at the news, um, I actually don't pollute my computer with the news. I look at news feeds on my phone um, because I want them in a different, I want that news in a different location. Um, there's an onslaught of news, you know, that there are three tigers left and there are no rhinoceroses left and, you know, more whales are dying and it's just one thing after another. So all of the other big mammals are being displaced by us. Um, anyway, everyone knows this. It, it's a lot of difficult feelings. They do get summed up as something called eco grief. I think that um, there are things that we need to reclaim while keeping all of the other things like digital. Uh, something that I think is going to come something that, that, that we're going to move into after digital while still keeping digital, just as we've kept phones and we've kept writing um, and we've kept, um, I don't know, heraldry. Um, and so I think that perhaps uh, McLuhan's four things, the Tetrad could be applied in a positive way to bring that about. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madeline. Next up is Dave. Dave, what do you think? How can we use media? Uh, how can we use the knowledge of McLuhan to make life better? Well, I want to go back to my previous comment about radio, that how it was bringing the country together and how beneficial it was. But I think I'm negative about where we're going now to the cable television network with all the channels, I think it's causing us to be much more tribal. And uh, with the algorithm uh, that I think Jade was talking about in Google and all these other things, we're in a bubble. Uh, 
And that's why things like this, where we can talk to each other, I think is so valuable. But uh, I remember, I think the Facebook guy, I forget his name, was saying, well, you know, we only had good intentions for this because we're going to have people all over the world talking to each other. But I think he misunderstood how it'd be used to influence and occasionally incorrect information. Anyway, thanks very much for a great thank evening you. tonight. Uh, thank you, Dave. Um, all right, so we'll take the last question now, which is actually the most interesting one. Um, why do we need to retrieve things and what do we need to retrieve? So now try to keep as brief as possible. What do we need to retrieve? Anybody? Why do we need to retrieve? Why is retrieval necessary at all? And what do we need to retrieve? Marisa. Without acknowledgement of our past, we have no future. We're just doomed to be spinning around in circles to leverage off of those who have come before us and improve from their mistakes and avoid certain mistakes they've made is the path towards like true enlightenment. At least that's the way I see it. Wonderful. Thank you, Marisa. Next up is Joe, Jade, Meyer, and Dave. I can only give I can only give you half an answer, but I, I see it as balance. You know, that we can't be too far out of balance, and that's the point of retrieval. So that if we go too far one way, whether it be with TV or, and not reading any books as you you know you've used in examples in the past or only read books and you know not observe any type of other you know uh, information that that's what the point of retrieval there's a displacement but at some point you it brings a certain balance that we're looking for that's the point of retrieval thank you. thank you uh next up is jade jade um, do we need to retrieve I, I think I'm going to sum it up the way that I kind of did when we were talking about, um, I don't know what chapter it was in the, the Jordan Peterson thing was we just need to, because sometimes we throw the baby out with the bathwater. That's why we kind of need to retrieve. Mm -hmm. And I think I could leave it at that. People can contextualize it however they want, but when you're throwing the baby out with the bathwater, essentially you're throwing out something that um, is vital and important, or at least I hope you think that the baby is vital and important. But um, yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, it, uh, that's actually a great way of putting it because that's kind of the heart of displacement and retrieval combined. So it's like, you know, when you do something more of, you do something less of, and in that, there is something that you really cared about and that's gone. And then once it is gone, you have the opportunity of retrieving it. Uh, next up is Meyer, Dave, Kevin, and Mike. Meyer. So uh, I'd like to say, uh, well, can I, can I get the question again? Like, uh, the question just is, why, why is retrieval necessary at all? That's one. And what do we need to retrieve today? OK. Um, so why okay so why is retrieval necessary? Uh, so I, I think it just inherently every new media like the, the television well print Johannes Gutenberg uh, social media with the digital age today's digital age they just inherently have those like the four tetra they they go and cause that effect they, they, these effects occur and in in all four directions there and uh, so you have the you, so why the retrieval? So the question was why? Why was something? Why? Why? Why a retrieval was needed? Yes. Why clear? is retrieval necessary? I think uh, so. With so uh, with an example like Facebook and the Tetra, uh, the the small village was brought back. Everybody knew your business, and um, and and that was brought back. But at the same time, what what was displaced was your privacy was taken. That your anonymity that you had in the big city. Um, so I, I, does that make that clear? Or I think yeah, they just, I think, yeah, go ahead. Next up is going to be Dave, uh, Kevin, and Mike. Dave. Yeah, I want to start with my friend Maritz's comment about going back. Uh, to me, we're going back to go into depth. I just watched a wonderful a series on Lincoln that 
we all learned a little bit about him in school that he was you know, born in the log cabin and he debated Stephen Douglas and he was present during the Civil War. But when you get into depth, you can find out he was an imperfect person. And, but the good thing is he rose to the occasion. He did what needed to be done. And of course, we never know what could have happened because he was assassinated. But, uh, you know, I've talked before about the Ken Burns documentaries that are wonderful storytelling about our past that, as I said, we, so many times we get glossed over in school about a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and, and heroes we put on pedestals. But to me, uh, there's so much more to know. And like, as you say, we'll go into depth on Marshall McLuhan. To me, I'm very much, much looking forward to that adventure because to me, it is an adventure. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Um, Kevin, why do you think retrieval is necessary and what do we need to retrieve? Uh, uh, my uh, answer would be more about our own decisions as human beings. Let's see, we use the enhancement. Is that correct? Any, because based on current practice, we normally focus on product like what's the benefit bring to you. We lack like talk about this drawback. So for example, let's see our media, where her dinner time. The, the days we, we don't have electricity, nothing, we sit together with uh, one oil light then get good sleep. Now it's a lot of things we, mm -hmm. we kind of missing. And another one is the relationship with closer ones. Mm -hmm. It's a fr the phone, cell phone, social media, and a friend are, or a human being are friend. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. Um, Mike, 30 seconds on why do we need retrieval? Why do we need to retrieve things? Oh, you have an answer. In, uh, uh, and then uh, what do we need to retrieve? Well, uh, uh, we need to be able to retrieve anything we want to retrieve, but we should only be able to retrieve truth. Now, I'm not for government regulation, far be it for me to success government regulation, but government stepped in with uh, USCS 230 and Title 18, paragraph 47, and said that if no matter what you publish, you can't be sued. However, if uh, somebody says that, uh, they, that, that what you're saying is a lie, media can sue them. So uh, government needs to either, we do need to make, have some uh, checks and balances to make sure um, from the, uh, hopefully from the private secretary, sector or foundation to make sure that what we see is uh, unmanipulated, unvarnished truth. Thank you, Mike. Um, next up, uh, let's see. So I wanna talk a little bit about retrieval. I think this is a huge issue. Um, and I wanna tell you about one big retrieval project that we are, I'm going to start working on. And that is um, the, the greatest kind of retrieval project that I know of is the Great Books Project. And I'm going to have Fred Bueller who actually is from University of Chicago, where he heads the great books program over there. He has headed that, he's very familiar, he's been trained in the kind of Adler, uh, Mortimer Adler tradition uh, and Hutchins tradition of the great books. And he's been working on it for decades. So he'll be here next Sunday, uh, this coming Sunday at 2.30 to talk about great books and what they have to offer to us. Why should we go back and be familiar, familiarize ourselves with all of the thought and use that as a base uh, to, for our thinking. Um, and I, I do think that, I mean, the, the retriever is a huge issue because fundamentally human beings have a certain nature. Um, you know, McLuhan's view is that human being has a certain nature. So when you make progress on some things, many, many times, as Jade was saying, you know, you throw the baby with the bath water and that happens along so many different dimensions and you get caught up in the, what he would call the figure and you forget the ground. So you get caught up in whatever it is that is right there in front of you. 
and you don't, for example, notice that you are no longer having these long dinners with your family with an oil lamp, okay, uh, that Kevin was talking about, or the kind of interactions that you had with people before social media. Um, and this happens in along many different, you know, or, or the habit of using your body more uh, or nature more. So it's like there are many, many different axes along which there are things that we lose and bringing back even a small amount of that into our life can be extremely useful. But all of that requires what Maxine was talking about of contemplating media, you know, what is it that you're doing and what is it that you're trying to do and what are your values and are you achieving them? Um, so, so th these are the questions that, you know, Marshall McLuhan um, makes it easy to actually keep asking about everything that we are doing and all the tools that we are engaged in. So folks, uh, thank you very much. This was an amazing session. Uh, I really, really enjoyed hearing from everybody, uh, all kinds of comments um, and look forward to building on this. So uh, two things that I'm planning to do is one is I'm going to look at, uh, you know, with Peter Berkman, who has been studying the PhD thesis that Marshall McLuhan wrote on the trivium. Um, and the role of the trivium in both kind of education and literature uh, across history. That's what um, McLuhan did his PhD in Cambridge on. So we'll be talking about that uh, hopefully in the next couple of weeks. Uh, and then I definitely want to do more things on Tetrad. So stay tuned and hope to see you back soon. Thank you very much, everybody. Good night.